Thanks for tuning in to your day off podcast, hosted by your boys, Corey and Tony. I think by the end of today, I might have another best friend. They're committed to making you fall in love with the hair industry, one podcast at a time. Uh, you're going to grab a lot of information. Yeah, you're going to learn a lot. Presented by Hair Industry. Ladies and gentlemen, this is it. Your day off podcast will begin after a word from our sponsors. Sit with my best friend Tony. What's up, buddy? What's going on, brother? You know, I, I kind of want to open the conversation to say, like, you never know where your next meal is coming from. And what I mean by that is that our our guest today, we actually met through a client of ours. Yeah, and it, it was kind of funny how it all came up because you know we were drinking, well, at least I was drinking my favorite uh my favorite drink. The uh, the the healthy kombucha there, my yes, friend? that's yeah, a berry lemonade at that. <laughs> a berry lemon, th- those are good though. Listen, we um uh uh we're, today we're talking to uh, Diana Trout, and she's the founder of Health Aid Kombucha, and and I I love her story, and I love that you know she's kind of like an accidental entrepreneur, and I think that it fits so well for for our podcast because so many people that listen in are are kind of like accidental entrepreneurs or oh, dude, you know, she was accidental because i th- I think she just i don't know she just had an idea and uh she, she might not she didn't know how to maybe make it as big as it it got but it was definitely on purpose well we'll, we'll get into that story <laughs> won't we but uh, but you know so many of us find you know certainly in the industry somebody find like how did i become a salon owner or how did I end up working for this brand? Or how did you know? How did I kind of build that 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 kind of stuff? You know, so um, I, I think that there's a parallel there, and um, and she's done it on the absolute on a on a huge level. So I'm curious about getting into her story and and, and the breaks and the stuff and things that she had to force and the breaks that she got. It's funny because how how we got introduced to kombucha, and then how do we you know just we want we needed a kombucha fix, and you know you're trying all these different kombuchas, but. Health Aid by far, uh, hands down, has has definitely been my favorite. Uh, yeah, I'm actually I, I'm 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 opening up the conversation with that. So uh, should we get in? Let's do it, Miss Dinah Trout. Welcome to your day off. Hello. So all right. So what Tony said was right. So like we all kind of we went down like the the kombucha trail and we did like the mother's like vinegar thing and and I tried out a couple like uh, kombuchas for myself, but I was like. I don't know if this is me, man, because it's like, it's a tough swallow, pardon the pun, you know? And then I tried the health aid and I go, oh, okay. Now the health aid, they, they've they done something that makes it like easier to palate, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. We pride ourselves on being the best tasting out there. So I'm glad that hit home for you in, a, in the real world. Well, it, it definitely, it definitely worked out. How I, when, when I kind of think of like, cause you, cause health aid started in what, like 2010, 2011? 2012, March of 2012, we sold our first bottle at the Brentwood Farmer's Market. How'd you get into the kombucha world? Tell me, kind of walk us through, like, how did you find yeah. it? Did you find? Yeah, so, you know, we, th- so I didn't found it alone. I started this with my best friend, Vanessa, and my husband, Justin. And the three of us were all, for different reasons, feeling unfulfilled in our lives, or in our in the career portion of our lives. And so we all kind of had our different reasons, but we had the same sort of solution in our vision, which was we needed to start our own company. The time is now, you know, it didn't matter that we didn't have money, that we didn't have any experience. And I think that's what you meant by accidental. You know, our background didn't prep us for the beverage category. It didn't prep us for business even. Um but we had an insane amount of drive and um, willingness to work hard. And then we also had um, you know, a real desire to build a company of our own on our own terms, one that could make us proud and kind of put our mark on the world. Like that was the real drive. Um, and so we didn't we didn't have an idea yet of what we were going to sell <laughs> or start. Um, so really, 
I always say that like the passion was entrepreneurship or the drive was entrepreneurship, but the vehicle ended up being kombucha and that came second. It wasn't like we had some idea brewing for decades and then we finally got the confidence to do it. It was more like, okay, we're doing this. Life is short. We're not going to keep just like, you know, because we all had good, you know, good enough jobs. We could have just stayed there. That certainly would have been the safer thing to do. Um, but we really felt driven to like, we can't go one more year like this, you know? Um, so my background is in nutrition. I before, well, before, uh, we started health aid, I had been in graduate school for nutrition. I fell in love with food, um, not just cooking with it, but healing with it and doing all kinds of cool things with it. So when you would come to my apartment in grad school, I'd be like fermenting things and sprouting things. So I knew how to learn. I learned how to make kombucha like 10 years before starting health aid. I had no idea it was going to be like my identity, uh, you know, a decade later, but that's where, you know, we learned how to make it fast forward now to the three of us feeling unfulfilled. So it's around end of 2011, we started an entrepreneur club and we started to, you know, look at all kinds of ideas of what kind of business we could start. And we had to cross most off the list because they were way too expensive or we didn't have any sort of knowledge at all. Like, so what were some of the things that were on the list. Yeah. I mean, what was really cool is even though my background's in nutrition and food. So a lot of what I came up with was like food related or like nutrition related, you know, Justin and Vanessa were not. So the, the ideas were really, they spanned the gamut of like human experience. So uh, an example was Vanessa came in, one day. And okay. So one thing I should say is our entrepreneur club, we always had to come to the meeting having written down at least one thing that really irritated you that week. And like, there should be a solution for, you know? Ooh, and like yeah. And then we would sort of like review those things. And if any one of them felt like, oh yeah, this, this is like an everyday problem that everybody's experiencing and should definitely be solved by now, but isn't we would sort of take it to the next step. So anyway, and I, an example of something else, um, Vanessa came and was like, I love my high, my knee high boots, uh, but they fall all the time when I'm walking around and they like, they slouch down, you know, and what there should be some kind of really easy, cheap solution to keep these things up when I walk around. So I don't have to keep pulling them up. Right. Um, so that was like an example of, of a frustrating uh, experience. And then, you know, we started thinking about what a solution might be. So that was one that we kind of took to the next step. Um, another example would be, um, oh, I was getting married at the time. So I found the registry experience to be very frustrating that it was, it was really patchworked and it felt like there should be one single home you could go to and link all the different things that you wanted. This was sort of at the beginning of where everybody was starting to buy stuff online. Um, and of course now that exists, but the reason that ended up getting crossed off the list was as an example was, you know, I'm not a web developer or an app developer. Justin's not, Vanessa's not. And when we started sort of looking into what it would cost to hire something like that, it was in the like six figure cost arena. And we were like, okay, we have like $5,000. So um, it just kind of got, we, it never went anywhere because we knew we weren't going to be killer at it. Now with kombucha, it was funny because we would be like sipping on my kombucha and eating my sauerkraut at these meetings. <laughs> um, and we you never even- blow your nose the whole time. Right? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And we never even thought about the kombucha, to be honest, because uh, to sell it, because at that time, it wasn't yet a mainstream thing like it is today. And um, every store, at least in LA- already had at least one brand. I mean, it was, it wasn't like today where you've got like a whole fridge at Whole Foods that has like your choice of kombucha brands, right. but you could kind of get it at most grocery stores for sure. The natural ones and the company that was already out there had been there 11 years. So like in my, in our brains, we were like, okay, we're not even gonna like competing against that would be like going up against Goliath. You know, it was sort of, it just didn't even, it didn't even really, to be honest, enter a state of consideration. It was just, you know, you have good kombucha. Okay. We're drinking it at home. That's it. 
Um, but the reason we ended up going for it was sort of, uh, and this part was a little accidental. So I think it's cool that you said that having not even known the story. Um, Justin was frustrated with the very beginnings of thinning hair. He was 28 years old at the time. And he was like, I don't know what the deal is, but I feel like my hair on top is getting thin and I am not cool with that. You know, I think his hairdresser said, this is your last hurrah, Justin. Um, <laughs> and, and he was like, oh, hell no, I'm not ready for that. Um, so he was like, uh, you know, I would love to find solutions for hair loss. So we did take that one to the next step. And I, of course, having a background in food, started researching, you know, like holistic uh, potential sort of solutions that existed in like Chinese medicine or like food, you know, what could be out there that might help us, you know, regrow hair or strengthen hair. Um, and what I kept coming across online at the time was anecdotal videos and, you know, posts of people saying they use the kombucha culture as a mask on the head and that it would regrow their hair. And of course I knew how to make kombucha and I made a really good kombucha. So just to, you know, take a step out for a sec, for those of you that don't know, the way you make kombucha is you take tea, you make sweet tea, just like South Carolina style sweet tea, sugar, tea, water, has to be black or green tea. And you put this culture on top. The culture is often called the SCOBY. And it's an acronym for symbiotic culture of bacteria and yeast. But anyway, that's not important. It's a similar culture to, to the culture they use to make um, like yogurt, sour bread and stuff. Deeper sour sourdough, exactly, exactly. So it's a culture, and it ends up taking the shape of the vessel that you make the kombucha. And so, oftentimes, you'll see a scoby that's round and circular, um, kind of like a pancake, because that's the vessel that like somebody's making it. It's like a jar. Um, so anyway, people would take this culture and like dump it on their head, and you know, leave it there for twenty minutes or whatever, and then you know, over a few months time, you know, I guess new hair would sprout. And to make a culture, you have to make a batch of kombucha. Every time you make a batch of a kombucha, it makes another culture. So you, it's sort of like an ingredient and a byproduct. You can't make kombucha without the culture, but then when you make kombucha, it makes another culture. So it's like kind of cool. That's cool. Anyway. Yeah. So I start making a ton of kombucha, not for the liquid, but to cultivate these cultures that we were going to use on Justin as our guinea pig. And then ultimately save the world from baldness. Um, and so I'm making kombucha. And of course, I'm not throwing the kombucha away because it's really good kombucha. So I'm just bottling it. We get the cheapest bottles we can get at the local LA bottle supply store, which were like 70% off. They were these Boston round. I'll show you. We have these one? Boston round stock bottles. Right. And um, we put them in there and just put them up against my my wall and whenever friends would come over be like would you like a case of kombucha you know? yeah. <laughs> um we had no intention of selling it but people would keep coming back being like dude this kombucha is like really good i you know we would hear stories much like what you said um about you know your experience with kombucha and health aid being different so sorry about the stories almost coming to an end but essentially we thought we were going with hair loss and we got an opportunity to sell in the farmer's market. And one thing about me, Vanessa and Justin, is that we're really, we're a little bit impatient. Um, like once we decided we were going to make a hair loss product, it was sort of like we could not do it fast enough. It was sort of like, uh, when are we going to get out there? When are we going to make our first dollar? Like, let's go. Um, and so when this farmer's market opportunity came our way, it was a friend of Vanessa's. And she said, Hey, look, I've got an opening for the summer months at Brentwood, which is like a very coveted spot uh, for as farmers markets go in LA. And she was like, we're trying to bring like non-food items in or like more sort of packaged goods, not so many farmer goods. What about if you sell your hair loss product? Do you think you could have it ready by March? And we were like in January or something. And we're like, yeah, 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 totally. We, March is, <laughs> yes, you know? So we got the farmer's market permit for 150 bucks. We, uh, you know, we started <clears throat> taking our scobies and like mashing them up with avocados and different oils to see if we could make like a, like a palm, like a mask in a tub that you would put on the head. Um, and, 
you know, after about an afternoon of doing that, we're like, oh, shnikes, this is a lot harder than we thought. Like, first of all, it smells like kombucha and nobody wants to put that on their head. You know, uh, it's like fermented. Uh, second, it was not as, you know, pretty. I mean, there was a lot that we were going to have to figure out, we realized. And then we're like, well, time is ticking. We've got like eight weeks until we've got to set up and sell. And we like look over at our wall and we've got like 60 cases of unlabeled kombucha. And we're like, well, that's clearly what we're going to sell. So we thought the summer was going to be us selling the kombucha, um, you know, to make some money. We knew it was good enough to sell. And whatever money we made from the farmer's markets, we would apply to the hair loss business. But of course, uh, the summer had a very different story for us. And that was the beginning of health aid. So kind of cool. Yeah, it was accidental. You were right. Okay. I, yeah. Well, that's couple, crazy. Crazy. That's, right? well, couple, and and has questions. to do with hair as well. Exactly. Yeah, <laughs> I know. I know. That's, I thought that that's why you guys wanted me on because it well, was, yeah, we say from hair loss to health aid. <laughs> I love it, dude. Did it work? Did, did, did he? That's what we never, oh. we never ended up putting one scoby on his head. Oh, oh come on. I know what the hell. Right. And we keep saying like, God, that should really be our next innovation. You know, uh, you have to move in that way next. Right. I guess. I mean, it, it, that's how the story should go. Right. Ten years <laughs> later, has he lost any more hair? He has not. So maybe you just have to drink it. I don't right. know. Yeah. <laughs> Man, I should have found it earlier. I know. Right, Tony, where, 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 where was she when you were 18? Right. <laughs> so, yeah, that's the story. And, you know, the summer was like. Wow. I mean, we learned so much because first of all, we were hustling like crazy. We still had our full-time jobs. It was a total, uh, when I say the amount, like the amount of work that we did is hard to even get people who haven't started businesses to understand, but it, it was, um, just intense and insane. And we were doing it at all hours of the, you know, daylight and nighttime and it was nuts. But one thing we learned in the summer was, wait a second, we've got something people like. And um, people were kind of lining up. It was a farmer's market, so it was small sample size, but enough for us to be like, okay, we've got something here. Like this is more than we want to just walk away from. Uh, is it all one flavor? It started that way, but after just a couple markets, we, you know, we started getting the stuff that was in season at the farmer's market, juicing it, adding it. So like, it was a very seasonal at the farmer's market days. It was very seasonal. We had like, you know, uh, special flavors that would sometimes only be sold for a week. And we would sell out honestly within an hour. We could not make enough kombucha. It was like that hot. And we expanded to a few farmer's markets. I think at most that summer we were at in seven uh, different ones every week, but but the sweet spot was really three, seven felt like more than we could kind of handle just the three of us. So, uh, we did, we did three and we did three really well. Um, and by the end of that summer, we were like, okay, we want to keep going with this. Um, I have a couple more questions before we move yeah, on. Like, so like you were in seven farmers market, does, does kombucha have to ferment or is it pre-fermented or does it have to ferment in the bottle? It has to ferment both. So at that time, uh, so sorry, both. What I mean by that is it ferments. So it takes about two weeks to make. Okay. Um, so yeah, we would have to make a batch and then we would sell it two weeks from them. So it was sort of like constant making, constant selling, constant bottling. But yes, it ferments. Remember I said it starts with sweet tea in the culture. That happens in a large vessel or a larger vessel. In our case, we were making it in two and a half gallon cookie jars sort of looking like cookie jars. Um, so it ferments in there for about a week, depending on the weather. Um, because if it's hotter, it'll ferment faster, but let's just say about a week, give or take. And then it would go into a bottle and ferment, um, with a closed lid and that would make it bubbly. So that would take anywhere from two to seven days on top of that original week. So yeah, we said about two weeks to make a bottle. It was about two weeks to turn. Go ahead. Yeah, because I, I find your guys is a little bit more bubbly than than most. And that's one of the things I enjoy most about it. Nice. Yeah. You know, we always felt like, I mean, once we started really selling kombucha, the three of us were like, you know, the kombucha that's out there right now really has has not, I think, done a good job of marketing to mainstream America and mainstream America loves soda 
And who doesn't love a soda? It's such a treat. And we kind of felt like kombucha should own that space as people are becoming healthier, but they don't want to lose out on their treats in the day. Like kombucha felt like a very perfect fit here. And it was marketed at that point, I think in a very sort of hippie way, like it had like ohm symbols. It was very much marketed to the healthiest, healthy, 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 healthy. You know, if you ate five kale chips for dinner and you know, this is your fifth marathon of the year. Like that's who drank kombucha. We felt like it was way more mainstream than that. So our intention was with the flavors that we picked with the amount of bubbles that we wanted with even the look and feel of the bottle um, and how we talked about it. It was all meant to be very approachable to most people. You just had to be kind of inclined to be healthy. Like you're trying to leave soda. What are you going to have instead? Mm -hmm. Like those were our people. And I think it did, it did really well with that sort of product market fit. I, I mean, you guys definitely did an amazing job there, but when you came to market, like kom kombucha wasn't like for everybody, like everybody didn't hear about it. Like, so I'm, I'm curious as to like how you kind of marketed out into that space, you know, and then, uh, but before we get there, uh, 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 when you had three partners, like, how did you like come up with the name or like, like, like how, like, like, how did, how do you guys kind of like work out the partnership and, and, and does everybody come to the table? Like, let's use the name as the example. What was that story? It's a great question. Okay. So the name, remember that we thought this was just going to be a summer project. So there was not a lot of pressure. In fact, the pressure was all on the hair business. And this was one of our first lessons, I think about health aid, um, was that sometimes that pressure you put on yourself to get something perfect is not very productive because in the end, because there wasn't a lot of pressure, we just needed the product to be good enough to sell in the summer. I mean, the product was always amazing because I made the, I wanted to make the highest quality kombucha so it would make the highest quality SCOBY. Um, so the, the liquid was never compromised. But what I mean, I guess, is we came up with the name in 10 minutes. I mean, it was like, we were sitting around a table, Justin was drinking a Gatorade, um, and we were like, well, what do we call it? Well, we like the idea of aid, A-D-E, because, you know, it has a double pun of like, you know, aid could be thought of as helping something, right? A-I-D, but then also aid is known to be a beverage, lemonade, Gatorade. Um, I had just done a crossword puzzle and aid was, was, you know, <laughs> in, it's always aid and ire are in every single crossword puzzle, you know, under the sun. So, um, I was like, I like aid. And so we started saying like healthier aid. So I think for a few days, we called it healthier aid. And then that just felt like a mouthful. And so we were like, all right, health aid feels right. Again, not a huge amount of pressure. We're just talking farmer's markets. So we stuck with it. We made decisions really fast in that early stage because there wasn't as much pressure. And it was almost like enough, a filler name, right? Like, like until we figure it out, we'll just call it health aid. Yeah. But funny enough, it ended up being a, you know, brilliant name. And I, and I, and I'm so happy we, um, we didn't have this pressure to be like, is it good enough? Is it good enough? Is it good enough? Which I find so many starting entrepreneurs under that pressure. Um, and in a lot of ways, it was like a blessing in disguise that we didn't have that, you know, but yeah, the partnership is worth talking about because I think that is a top 10 problem, uh, amongst entrepreneurs. Um, you know, when I sort of do my, whatever you want to call it, like advising or mentoring other people in the early stages, you know, one of the top 10 issues is uh, issues with their co-founders or how do I find the right co-founder? And um, the issue usually is, usually is um, they don't put in the same amount of work like they did in the beginning, but then it shifted. Um, and one person's carrying more weight than the other or the others. And that's creating resentment. And we all know how that um, impacts relationships. So that's usually the problem. And then getting out of that sticky situation with a co-founder is really messy. Um, so I think the reason it worked is that we all wanted it equally bad and we were all willing to work equally hard for it. So it truly was a 33%, you know, 33.3333, whatever percent split. And no matter what the job was, we were all we all gave it our all. And I think that was the secret. You know, it was really simply that 
We just, I mean, of course we trusted each other and we could communicate. And yes, there were challenges. I mean, who wants to go into a business with their spouse? It's, it's, it maybe sounds romantic on the outside, but it's hard. And it puts a natural, unnatural burden, I'd say on the, on the relationship, friendship too. Um, but just like anything, if it doesn't kill you, it kind of makes you stronger. And that, that was the case for us. So yeah, I think the, the key, the key, the sort of special key was we were all in it equally. Who, who, whose idea was to, uh, bring to the table, like, I think we might be able to get it into a store. And what was the first store? Oh, yeah. So, you know, it was kind of cool. Everything with Health Aid happened very organically. Um, so it was fast, but it was organic. So, like, we were at the farmer's markets and, you know, people are buying a bottle at a time. Obviously, we want them to buy more than a bottle. So when they would buy six packs or 12 packs, they would get a bit of a discount. But 12 packs are 40 pounds, right? Because it's a glass liquid and you got to keep it cold. And a lot of people at farmer's markets are like going to lunch after or they want to stroll around. Like who wants to carry a 40 pound box home? So they would start to say, hey, I'll buy a case or I'll even buy two if you'll deliver it to my house after. I'm just five minutes down the road. And this happened enough times that we saw it was a business opportunity. It was sort of a win-win because we wanted to sell two cases at a time too. So we started delivering to people's homes after the market with just like our car, you know, um, but it's the business started getting so big uh, or that part of the business started getting so big that like we couldn't fit our car with enough cases to deliver. So next thing is you need a bigger car, right? So then we rented a van and then the van got too big, but at that same time, or sorry, too small. Um, at that same time, people that had like local mom pop shops, like cool markets in LA, liquor stores that would be shopping at the farmer's market would be like, I would love to sell this in my store. Can you drop it by my store on Monday? So very organically, um, this this sort of wholesale business or at least delivery business began. And we added to our task list, essentially, not just making the kombucha and selling it at the farmer's market, but now also delivering. And by the middle of the summer, like by July, we were delivering kombucha seven days a week um, around LA. I think we were in about 40 stores Whoa. and we had at least 100 customers that we were delivering to on a weekly basis. So, and that became its own sort of like, well, how does this business scale? Like, are we just going to keep buying vans and just mm -hmm. scale that way? I mean, it wasn't fun. That part wasn't fun for sure. Um, so we wanted to get in a bigger store, like a, like a grocery store that was going to buy like, like a chain. Yeah. That yeah. was going to buy like 60 cases and give like 10 to each of their stores or whatever. And are you still making it in your house? Yeah. So we were making, this was kind of cool. Remember we didn't have much, many, much money and LA is expensive. So it was sort of like, we had no choice we felt, but to make it in our kitchen. Now, when we were selling it in farmer's markets, that was perfectly fine. You just, there was like, there's this thing called the cottage food act, which allows you to sell under a certain amount. Um, if you make it in your home, the public health inspector comes to your home, make sure that your operation is clean, which it was, but they let you sell like that to farmer's markets. Um, but once you start selling to stores, you technically have to have a wholesale kitchen that's permitted by the public health department. And we didn't have that. However, and we didn't have money to like buy our own and a shared kitchen wasn't an option because remember it takes two weeks to ferment. So like usually shared kitchens, you come in, you do your thing, you come out. It's we're like looking for space to store it. We need to heat it um, in the storage area. So it was sort of complicated. It wasn't easy to share a kitchen with people. But we did have a friend, and this is sort of where the, I guess, the the gritty part comes in. But we had a friend who ran a bake shop in Manhattan Beach, and she sold, like, awesome scones, croissants, that kind of thing. And she was closed on Sundays and Mondays. Those were her day off. And we basically offered her, we'll keep your store open Sunday, Monday. We'll sell for you for free, uh, make you those revenues um, if you let us, you know, store our kombucha and make some of our kombucha there. So. Anyway, for a little while, we were sort of doing it half in the kitchen, half in uh, 
her kitchen. And that's how we kind of got by until we had enough money that we felt like we could, we could stand, you know, a $3,000 a month rent to be in our own kitchen, which took about a year. I think we moved into our first kitchen in January of 2013. So like a little under a year later. That's amazing. How did you, how did you, I have so many questions. I, I've got to <laughs> calm them down, but um, so I, I know you've lived in DC and I know you've lived yeah. in Boston, right? So like, how did LA is a very unique market, right? So how did you know, or, or did you just trust that there was a market outside of LA for kombucha? Because kombucha sounds like a very inside LA kind of thing. And, and I don't, I don't necessarily know if I, if, 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 if it was me, if I would have thought that there was a market outside of, of, of LA. Yeah, we didn't know. I mean, nothing we knew. And that was always the, that was always the um, criticism, I guess, of investors as they would, as they would consider coming into the business. Um, later on in the story, we can talk about how that sort of evolved, but um that was always their criticism. Oh, LA is a niche market. You're doing well in LA. Is it going to work anywhere else? You know, me and Justin and Vanessa were just like, shut the F up. Like, this is going to fucking work everywhere. Sorry for the swear words. That's like, okay. just, it was not even a question. Part of it was that our, our livelihood depended on this. And it was more than that. Like, we had put so much on the line, you know, with starting this thing. It felt like our our pride was on the line. It felt like our identity was on the line. So it just had to work. Um, I don't know how to describe it any other way, but it felt life or death. So yeah. it was sort of like, oh no, this is going to work in New York. Like we're going to see to it, <laughs> you know? Right. <laughs> They're going to be in the vans delivering it to all the- uh, Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I think we also believe that the health and wellness market was like not only growing in LA and- when you think about yogurt, as an example, 40 years ago, yogurt was strictly a hippy dippy thing. And now it's completely mainstream and like completely, completely mainstream. And we really felt kombucha was no different than that. Um, and arguably even more, you know, app appetizing and tasty than yogurt. So we were sort of like, no, 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 we, we just need to pave that way. Um, so yeah, we believed it. We believed it. That's just such a huge task, you know, again, because most of the country, I mean, I certainly in 2012 either didn't know about kombucha or I was just starting to learn about it. So like, yeah. it's, 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 it's interesting. And, and, and to me, I'm almost intimidated for you. Like, how do you get mm -hmm. that word out that this is the thing, you know, or that this is, this is really good for you. How, how, how did you guys like obviously the three of you, 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 I mean, it can be chaos making the product, distributing the pro products to the to the hundred customers that you have, but still getting together and like, how are we going to continue to grow this thing? How you know? Because there's still business, the business side that you're still learning on top of everything else. I mean, how was that? Yeah, I know, and you know. Look, I know if you go to business school or if you have a business background, that's a huge amount of work that you do up front. You figure out what do your margins need to be, you know, because remember that food in America, typically, if you're selling a grocery, you've got a few middlemen, you know, you're not selling directly to the consumer, you're selling to the distributor, who is the truck that takes you to the store. And then you're selling, and then the store needs, so the distributor needs to make a cut the store needs to make a cut. So there's a lot to consider. Um, and, you know, I'm, I'm almost embarrassed to say that we were completely unaware and dumb of that. And when we came up with our pricing, it was sort of like, well, it feels like people will pay $5 for this. And we had no real concept of what the product cost us. Yes, we knew what the tea, sugar and water cost us, but like we weren't estimating yet our labor or when we scaled how that how that labor would evolve right we weren't paying ourselves in the beginning so our cost our idea of what the product cost was just wrong and um we also really had no vision on how we could scale it you know i think one of the things that's kind of funny about 
a business that grows like ours did, which was really fast and one that you're making the product. So scaling and evolution is like a really important part to how you get to, you know, let's say every fridge in America, which was our dream. Um, if I had walked in to our brewery today, so today we've got like over a hundred thousand square feet. It's a pristinely run, beautiful brewery with $20 million worth of stainless steel in it. Like it, it blows me away when I walk through it today. If I had walked through that as an early entrepreneur, I would have been so discouraged. I would have said, I have no freaking idea how I'm going to build this. If you're telling me I need to have this brewery to get my dreams, like I would have actually been discouraged and maybe even quit. Um, because in fact, I didn't need to know how to do that right away. I didn't need to know that until year seven. And by year seven, I learned a lot. <laughs> so I don't know. I mean, our story and look, every story is different. There's no right or wrong way to do it. I think there's infinite ways to do it. But our story was one where we took it one step at a time and we built our first brewery with everything we knew. And so the way we scaled the first time was we bought, you know, a $50,000 piece of equipment that helped us do it faster. And then brewery B or the second brewery was a little bit faster and it kind of improved the things that we needed it to improve. So we went sort of this stepwise, very organic um, approach. Um, and I think that was exactly right for us because we never had Boku money to overinvest right? Um, we only had like, we always, always, always only had, you know, a little bit more that we could be like, okay, we can make this one part of the process better. Um, and then also it allowed for us to sort of right size our growth. Like we never needed to bring like, I mean, we all expertise helped us along the way as we hired, but I mean, I don't know. It wasn't until we were really substantial business that we started bringing on true experts um, to help us scale. So anyway, long-winded answer, but I would say scaling for us was very stepwise, very organic, and we took it one step at a time. You know, you had to, you knew you were driving all the way to New York, but you only had to see as far as your headlights, you know, step by step. Does that make sense? Yeah, I love that. Yeah. How did you know, how did you know when you needed investors? Oh my God. That also was a crazy fire drill. Um, I remember the moment it was July, 2013. So about a year and change in, we were in this new brewery making, we could not make enough kombucha at this point we had quit our jobs. So it really was life or death. You know, it really felt like this has got to work. And we um, this sort of actually piggybacks on your previous question about our first like real grocery store, but we had just started selling now into a few grocery stores that had chains. One of them out here is called Gelson's. You guys don't have them on the East coast, but it's like an 18 store chain and it's connected. I think the person who owns Gelson also Gelson's also owns these two other grocery stores called lazy acres and Bristol farms. So together it had the potential to be like 50 stores in the LA area. And they're like premium, perfect grocery stores for us. Uh, anyway, so we were in Gelson's, we were in Lazy Acres at this point. So we were starting to sell some real kombucha. They were ordering hundreds of cases at a time. And um, just the way that these bigger stores work, I had mentioned that you're paying the distributor, sorry, the distributor pays you, and then the store pays the distributor. A lot of times when you're selling food or beverages into a store, you're not seeing the cash from the product that you sold them for like 60 days after you give it to them. And remember, our product takes two weeks to make. So we're now talking about, you know, 45, 50 days that you have to front the cash for something before you get it back. And when you're growing really fast, and somebody's ordering now 200 cases all of a sudden, you're fronting the cost of that well before you've received a, enough cash to make it work. So like there was this moment where we were growing so fast in that summer that our cash just went to zero in, in such a fast time. We had no idea it was coming our way. My dad's kind of in business and he would always try to like, you know, 
not snoop, but he would always try to like insert himself and be like, how can I help? And I think I was too proud to let him in. But one of the things he always told me was like, cash is king, Dinah, cash is king. And like, he couldn't have been more right because there was this moment where we're like, oh my gosh, how are we here right now? We have no cash to pay for the freaking tea for this order. Even though we were selling a ton, it, it just, it was like cash out did not equal cash in. And that was um, a big problem. So that was when we realized it. And American Express was our credit card. And I, I hate to call them out here, but um, we have like a $50,000 limit and we were at that limit. Like it was already maxed out. So I'm like, oh, it's okay. We'll just, act, we'll get an extended limit. We've paid it every month. Surely they will expand our credit. Um, and we called them and they're like, oh no, no, like we don't even have to send this one up the, t the, the flagpole. It's denied. Why was it denied? Well, we were only in business a year. We didn't even have like four full quarters of a PL to show. High growth businesses like ours are exciting, but they are not safe. And so no banks wanted to loan us any money. It was just this like perfect storm of, oh my gosh, we're like out of cash and nobody wants to give us any. So mm -hmm. we were like- Hold on, hold on. I got to sit, I got to sit yeah. back for just a sec. <laughs> okay. Think about like- you're so successful, right? As far as like, you're putting out, you're getting a lot of product out there. You're not getting a lot of money in return for that product because of the the delay on it. And just to be able to sit there and be like, holy cow, we've got a really successful product that we might not be able to pay for. Yeah. Like, I can't even like imagine. And you no, it was a very it. dire moment. <laughs> it was a dire moment. We were like, I guess we're going to have to shut this down. Like we can't buy the tea. Like, how, but how do you just shut it down? Like, like it's, it's, I know it feels like, and, and the funny thing is like at that exact time, and this was so true with health aid, like what it looked like on the outside to people was so different than what it looked like on the inside, you know, on the outside. I remember Cameron Diaz had just bought some at the farmer's market and it was like all over us weekly. And I think even Angelona jo Jolie had a bottle and we were doing like Rob Pattinson's birthday party. Like, so on the outside, it was like bigger than it was. But on the inside, we were like, oh my God, Justin and I were living on $7 a day collectively. We were eating ramen noodle for morning, noon, and night. We were going to get evicted because I hadn't paid rent now. It was dire. It was dire on the inside. So, you know, if I were to start a business again, <laughs> I would probably do the cash thing differently. But we did make it through. We did make it through. Is that, is that when you guys decided that we need investors? Yes. Yes. So basically it was when, when Amex gave us the, you know, clean denial. Uh, and we had been to a bunch of banks already. You know, we had done all the sort of things that we were like, okay, we need cash like today. And so I remember the moment we had a whiteboard. We wrote, <laughs> we wrote down all of our like rich friends' names or anybody we knew that could be wealthy. And we were like, let's, we're going to pitch this. And like, as if it came from God in the sky, I'm not even kidding you. The same day that we wrote all those names down, I get this random 617 call, uh, area code 617. For those of you that know, that's Boston. Um, I'm like, who is this? I pick up the phone. It happens to be a man by the name of Tom First, who started Nantucket Nectars in the 1980s. And he was like super successful, big beverage guy. And he's like, Hey, I bought, I bought a bottle of yours off the shelf at the store called farm shop in Brentwood. He's like, it's the best kombucha I've ever had. I want to talk about an investment. And we were like, what, <laughs> what, what, what? Dude, I yes. Great. When did you meet? How about today? <laughs> well, hold on. How did he get your number? Well, oh, okay. So on the back of our bottles, actually still today, it says, you know, call us at one eight four four for ment. And that was a, you know, one eight hundred number we had we had paid for, but it went directly to myself. Whoa. It, do it doesn't anymore, by the way. It goes, <laughs> <laughs> it goes to the oh, health man. headquarters. But really? but yeah, yeah. So I was definitely like, is this some kind of a prank? Justin likes to prank. So I was like, this is not the time, bro. Yeah, but it was a really good Boston accent. So I was like, mm, this feels real. Um, anyway, yeah. So Tom first happened to work for. Tom first was first. Yeah. And he worked for a company called First Beverage Group. And they were a private equity company. Anyway, we met with them. 
And we just, we like scrounged through those next four weeks, but it only took about four weeks. And, and after that first investment, we got about 2 million bucks. So it was, it was dire. It was definitely darkest before the dawn, you know, really. I remember the day we got the money too. And remember the money goes to the business. So it's not like suddenly me, Justin and Vanessa are like, whew, we can pay our rent now. You know, it's sort of like, oh my gosh, we can like pay our vendors. Um, anyway, cause we had used all of the avenues. I mean, I think at this point we had collectively like 25, 26 credit cards around the room. We had not paid our rent and taken whatever money we had from saving. I mean, it was just, there was nothing left. It was the bottom, bottom, bottom scraping up pennies. Um, yeah. yeah. Anyway. So we got the, so that was how it worked. We got lucky. We got really lucky. Yeah. That's a true all or nothing story. Did, did Tom, was he able to help you? Um, since he's already done it. Yeah. To, to, to share some of that knowledge. Yeah. I mean, for sure. And this is the beauty of bringing in investors that offer more than just capital. They can offer you some value through their knowledge and experience. But one thing I will share is you learn most of it. Like there's, there's just so many different dynamics that make your experience sort of custom and especially if somebody did it 10 years ago, there's just so much that's different. They they help you most, I think, by sharing that they had a similar experience and you're kind of like, okay, I'm exactly where I need to be. But they don't they don't have as many solutions as you'd expect them to. Like it still was on us to figure out. But yes, they helped us figure out things like our PL, how to get that straight and right. Um, but the capital is what helped us the most. I mean, the capital for one allowed us to start paying ourselves a very modest, but at least something salary. It allowed us to hire people, which was huge. I mean, our first employee, his name was Darius and he's still at the company. He is currently like leading all of the supply chain company. That's like, you know, doing 150 million in revenues. Now it's like so cool that he just rose with the tides year over year, but he was the first employee. and. He was like a film production assistant, you know, and those guys are just really logistic oriented. They have to plan all kinds of things. It's awful hours. It's not always the best work environment. So he was thrilled to come on for something that had like a night, you know, daytime sort of weekends off um, vibe. And he, um, and we didn't even know what to call him, you know, because we needed so much help at that point that we just... His title was athlete. We called him the athlete because <laughs> I, I didn't know what to call him. I'm like, I need you everywhere. I need you to do sales. I need you to pick up the broom and clean the brewery. I need you to brew. I need you to do it all with all of us. Um, so anyway, you know, it was, it was really helpful to have that capital. Um, and, you know, we raised money every single year for the first six years. Over the 10, 11 year period that we had health aid, we had to raise over over $60 million. So it was, you know, one of the things that, again, I've said it before, like businesses are all run differently. And I don't think there's one a right or wrong way to do it. If it works, it works. For us, we were super fast growth and therefore we needed capital. Like you can do it more slowly if you have your own capital and stuff. And some businesses did that. But for us, it was sort of like, turbo mode, go as fast as you can, land grab, expand fast, grow, grow, grow. Because what we learned from these guys is, and not, not every category is the same, but we learned that in beverage, when you look at the brands that you know, Coke, Diet Coke, Pepsi, there's at most three brands in a category that kill it. And then everybody else is fighting for four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. But one, two, three is like 80% of the market. And that's across the board, true in beverage. And so they were like, there's already a number one. He's been here 11 years at this point, 12. Two and three are all that's left. And there are 20 new kombucha companies a year right now. So if you want a, if you want a shot of being one of the top 
and we did, right? We wanted to be, we wanted this to be life-changing for us. Um, it was, it was, it did feel like a land grab. It did feel like, oh no, you, you got to get New York first. Um, so it very much drove the velocity of our growth to sort of taking on investment from private equity. You know, it's, it's sort of like we all signed up for, all right, we're going fast. But how did you know? I mean, did, I, I, did you talk to other people? Did you talk to lawyers? I mean, how did you know uh, what was acceptable or, or the terms or, I mean, that, that can. And they were in a place of vulnerability, right? So like yeah. you're super vulnerable. So how did you know you were getting a fair deal or a real deal? Is that what you're asking? Yeah. 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 And that's part of the luck, I think, is I'm really grateful, Tom, first, if you ever hear this, I'm really grateful for him. I think because he was a founder first um, and he himself had his own journey like this, uh, that he he made sure it was a win win. I'm not sure that if it was someone that was strictly coming from the world of finance, you know, only private equity, that they would have done the same. But he always kind of just ensured that it was a good deal on both sides. And he would sort of like give me advice and stuff and be like, y you can do better than this. And and on the side to ensure that it was like a good deal. And I'm so grateful for that today because I didn't know everything I didn't know. For sure, we had a lawyer. I mean, we weren't like that dumb. We had a lawyer and we had sort of a secondary lawyer lawyer that was like guiding us so we had like one guy that was like writing all the documents and stuff and the red lines and then we had another that was sort of just really experienced in beverage and somebody we could talk to so we did have some people in the room to help us at that point um but still i feel like we could have been royally effed over and we weren't um i think mostly because i had somebody i could trust on that other side so and how, and how does this work? So and I, I don't understand this, the, the investment part. So so Tom comes in, he gives you a little like breathing room with it. And then you said that you continue to raise money now. Now, with Tom being the first investor, are you also raising money against his capital as well or his his um what word am I looking for? His percentage is his yeah. uh, equity as well. Yeah. So as you as you invest, as you get investments, everybody gets diluted ourselves included. I mean, that first, that first money we got, we gave away a lot, you know, for 48% of our business to, Tom. we needed it. to Tom's company first. Well, it wasn't his, it's actually Bill Anderson's company. Ironically, it's called first beverage and Tom first's name was Tom first, but those actually weren't related. Not related. Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But yes, to, to the business he worked for first beverage. Exactly. So, so you, yeah, when it, when it came, them? what's that? Did you need to get permission from them to, to raise money or were they? Oh yeah. We were all, we were all like holding hands in this, you know? Oh, um, yeah. You know, once we got money from them, they're a part of the team. They don't just like give you money and then walk away. They're like, okay, every month we meet, we need to see your P and L's there. They're, we build the budget. I mean, we operate and run the company. I was CEO. So I'm doing all of that. They approve the budget. We have targets um, that we want to try to hit. And we, we, we pretty much hit all of them. I mean, we grew, we set our eyes to extraordinary heights as far as growth goes. And we, we did well. Um, but so, so, you know, they knew when we were running out of money, it wasn't a surprise. This is sort of what was expected. This, sorry, this was what was expected. Um, so it was like, not a surprise. We knew when it was coming, right? This wasn't like, oh shit, we need money today. It was like, okay, in about six months, our cash is going to run out. Uh, you know, if we're going to keep growing at these heights, but we kept hitting our target. So it was easy to raise money. I mean, when you're growing like this um, and you're continuing to do better, we weren't profitable yet, but we were making our way toward profit. Um, all those things made it very easy to raise money. And then also counter that or not counter that, but combine that with the fact that the category of kombucha was growing like crazy. So people were coming in in buckets and droves to the kombucha category. I mean, it was growing at 400%. It was crazy. So investors are excited about that. They want to they wanna invest. We had kind of our pick, I would say, in those early years. It wasn't always like that, but... Um, for the first five years or so, it was pretty easy to raise money and health aid continued to perform. So 
it was a good deal. But yeah, everybody gets diluted, including ourselves. And, um, but the idea is the pie gets bigger, you know, like you can, you know, you can think about selling it for a lot more. So uh, even if you just own 10% of something at the end, if it sells for 300 million bucks, that's, that's a lot of money. So that was sort of, I think everybody's idea. Wow. That's so crazy. It's so cool. And then, so, so you're, you sold the company, right? Sold the company about a year ago. It was a freaking miracle. And I, I literally cannot believe still to this day. I'm so grateful. It was such a cool ride. And I'm so grateful that it ended the way it did because it doesn't always end that way, you know, where somebody can take it to the finish line. So many things can happen. The market can change on you. The consumer can give up on the category. You know, the product cannot scale. I mean, shit just happens to ever so many. So I feel really lucky. But yes, we sold it and I'm so grateful. I'm I don't even work there anymore, wow. which is crazy. It was the company I started. It's got a new CEO. It's nuts. <laughs> <laughs> but you was it was it bittersweet? Yeah, of course. Um, I mean, I will say this selling it was not bittersweet. Selling it was the best decision we ever made. Um you know, at that time, again, so many things to unpack. It was COVID. So we sold it in 2021. Um, so we were still very much in the throes of COVID lockdowns, impacted markets, not knowing if a recession was coming, not knowing what the future looked like, la, la, la. Um, running manufacturing during that time was extremely challenging. Um the category of kombucha had, and this happens a lot in beverage, especially anywhere you sell a product where there's a lot of competition. When the wave starts, everybody comes pouring in. Everybody's making kombucha. They're all trying to vie into this, you know, growing category. And then it gets saturated um, and things start to level out. It's called the shakedown part of the curve. And people get shaked down. And this is where those top three brands kind of like in beverage tend to sort of make themselves shown. And luckily Health Aid was one of those. Um, although I would say it was a lot more to do with hard work than than luck, but, but happy for sure that it, we were at the top three. And so what happens at that stage also is usually innovations happen in that same world that are like adjacent to the category. So like health and wellness and fermented things started to become popular and other things start showing up. Like maybe they're not kombucha, but they're similar to kombucha and they're in a can and they're a buck cheaper. So what ends up happening is the category starts to get more competitive. Um, you know, Tesla used to make the only electric car and now there's like 20 to choose from and there'll be 40 to choose from next year. So like Tesla's, the, the category of electric cars that I actually don't know anything about, but for sure the category of kombucha started to kind of flatten and that changes a lot. So we didn't know what the future looked like. So selling was a really good thing for us because um, even though we believed that it was going to keep growing, I didn't know that for sure. And COVID challenged things too. Um, and, you know, we had built this business to be over a hundred million in revenues. And like, we hadn't taken much money off the table, the three of us. And we were ready for that. We all had kids now. I had been doing this for 11 years. I was so tired. Um, I wanted somebody else to take the CEO seat. I was just tired. I was ready for a break. So like all these things drove the decision and I'm so happy it, it, it ended up happening. Um, but I stayed on. I stayed on for a year and a half after the sale. And I only stopped working there about a month ago. Did they ask if you would stay on? Mm -hmm. They were really respectful and worked with us closely on, um, you know, our, our desires and stuff. Like, so Justin wanted to exit right away. Um, he's just kind of that kind of guy. He was just like, I don't, I don't want to mess around with this sort of like new ownership. I want out. So he agreed that as soon as we hired a COO to replace him, he would be out. So he was out right away, but they wanted me to stay. And I wanted to stay. I felt like I couldn't leave my, <laughs> I almost said my children. Um, but yeah, it is. My employees. Yeah. It felt it like my, you raised them. Yeah. 
So I wanted to make sure health aid was like in good hands and gosh, I mean, I had run that thing for 11 years. So I just could not fathom walking away like that. Um, Justin's like, peace. Justin was like, peace. Very, <laughs> very Justin. He, but you know, in operations, it is a little cleaner. I was always like, I had my hands in every pot there. You know, I mean, I was still tasting every single batch. So there was a lot to replace when I exited, not to, not to exclude either the emotional connection I had. So bittersweet isn't, um, is, is a perfect word, actually, I would say to describe it. And those, those, that because time that kombucha? I was. <laughs> <laughs> Dumb joke. What, what advice would you have for uh, a young entrepreneur uh, that's, that's coming up? I mean, what, what words of wisdom do you have? You know, I would say things like um, follow your gut because there is no playbook or guidebook. Um, you know, it's good to get insights around the room, but ultimately you hold the paintbrush and it's your canvas and you might be right, you know, even if you do it differently. So you've got to really tap into your knowledge, your intuition and like make decisions that you are going to, you know, that you essentially are going to go to bed at night and say, all right, win or lose, I chose that. You know, you're not following someone else's footsteps. I think for sure, follow your gut. And then the second thing is, especially if they haven't gotten out there, it's like, I think making a bad decision is better than making no decision at all. I know I'm not the only one that said that. And I think there's even like a, a good quote. Um, but the gist of it is like, just do it get out there, start making decisions, get the product out there. I mean, for the love of God, we said yes to the farmer's markets when we didn't even know we were selling kombucha yet. And look how it turned out. I think what's more hurtful to entrepreneurs is getting paralyzed and not making decisions and getting scared to take the risk. And I think a better thing to do is get in the game, figure it out. You'll figure it out. You're betting essentially on your problem solving capabilities which have got to be excellent if you're going to be a successful entrepreneur anyway. So just get out there and figure it out. That's, that would be my two pieces of advice. Awesome. And can you ship Corey a Scooby with the, <laughs> with, with the avocado? For a friend, right? For yeah. a friend. <laughs> Mixed with the avocado, right? Yeah. <laughs> That's crazy. That's so awesome. Are you, are you, uh, are you, uh, are you interested in uh, what's next for you? Now that you've kind of sold health aid, do you guys have any plans? Or are you kind of sitting back a little bit? Uh, well, we're Justin and I are a little bit different in that route. You know, he he was out of the company a good year before me, um, and so he's already now on another venture. Um, he's starting something with a friend uh, in the supplement world. Um, I I am not interested right now on jumping back into entrepreneurship yet. I have a feeling there'll be another thing. But for now, what I'm trying to do is really be disciplined about creating some space to kind of have some yang to the yin. I'm feeling very called to do creative stuff. So I'm like taking art classes and acting classes and singing classes. I'm just having fun. I've got a seven-year-old and a three-year-old at home. So like I'm trying to spend more time with them and just really enjoy life. And until I'm feeling like, okay, I want to do this. So that's where I'm at right now. You mentioned earlier in the beginning of the podcast uh, that you do mentorship. Do yeah. You, you do? Yeah, I do from time to time. I mean, you know, if somebody's got questions, usually they can just DM me on Instagram. And like, if it feels like a good fit, I'll jump on the phone. Um, I haven't like made a business of that or anything. It's just really, um, you know, to help people out and pay it forward a bit. Yeah, we have a friend. Uh, she uh, She's young and she... Uh, started the shear company and she's the only female shear company and her shears are legit uh there's some of the the best scissors in the world there's only like a handful of companies that use true japanese steel she doesn't so her and her and her, and her fiance they created the scissor company but uh i think she 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 could use a mentor that's that kind of, uh, not saying that, you know, I would connect you guys, but if, if you're, I'll have her DM, have, have her before. DM me or, or if you, you, yeah, have her DM me on Instagram. Yeah. Cause she's uh, the product itself. It, it, it's like a, 
health eight. It's, it's top notch. And, uh, but she's just, she's young. And uh, I, I think uh, she, she could go far with it. And she just needs some, needs, some, needs some guidance, right? She needs some Dinah trout. Awesome. Cool. That's right. Dinah, thank you so much. Thanks for hanging out with us. Thank you for giving us our, your time, dude. It was like, it was yeah, such a pleasure cool. to meet you and hang out with you. And like, you know, we, we flew through that hour. Like, you know, it's a good I conversation. Know, right? like, oh, that was an hour? What? Yeah. Are you crazy? You're about to get kicked out of the room. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I, 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 that's why my dog was barking. I locked the door though. So my husband's like, what the fuck? I'm like, it's like, like oh, come on, let me in. <laughs> Awesome. Um, but I do have to go. It was so nice to meet you guys. It was a pleasure. It truly is. Thank, thank you, you so much. much. Cool. Mr. Day, Dinah, I'm going to get that right one day. Dinah Trout, thank you very much for hanging out with us. And thank you very much for joining us on your day off. Awesome sauce. Bye. Thanks for listening. If you enjoyed this episode and you'd like to help support the podcast, share it with friends, give us a rating and drop a review to listen to all the latest podcasts. Please subscribe from your favorite podcast outlet and to stay connected on and off the show. You can follow us at hair Distry on Instagram and all other social media platforms. Thanks again. And we'll see you next time. Peace and love.